comments? Uh, thanks for coming very much. And um, if you have any questions, step up to the microphone, and we'll do some Q&A for a little bit. Um, in discussing uh, transitional forms especially, it, it seems to me that we uh, have uh, folks of different persuasion looking at transitional forms or supposed transitional forms, and one man says, look, this is a transitional form, and one man says, this is not a transitional form, it's a species unto itself. I think we have a problem of definition of terms, and I wonder if you could define for me what you mean by transitional forms, and how do you know if it is or isn't? Okay, that's a good question, a very good question. Uh, there is no way you can know whether or not an animal is a transitional form without going back in history and observing the evolution. You can guess. What we can do is take animals that appear to be in between A and B. So we got A.5 in between. And yeah, the animal here, and animal here, and yeah, this looks like it's in between, so we say that's a transitional form. What often happens is, though, is we have an animal here, we have an animal here, we discover an animal in between, then we discover more animals that overlap the two animals they're supposed to be transitional to. This is what happened with human evolution. We had a nice, neat pattern from here up here, and then we discovered intermediate forms, then we discovered a lot of the intermediate forms were overlapping with the form that they supposedly evolved from. You can't live the same time of the animal that you supposedly evolved from. So yeah, it is a big problem. And that's when you read the literature, they argue all the time over what's a transitional form, or at least commonly do. Archaeopteryx, probably the most famous transitional form, among eminent paleontologists, about half say it is and half say it isn't. And that's all too common. Good question, thank you. I have a question. Sure. Um, how come the animals that are fossilized are so much bigger than the animals today? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, probably the, the uh, conditions were different. They think there was a richer level of oxygen, so therefore they had more oxygen. Uh, instead of what we have now, around 21%, they thought maybe it's you know, 23, 24%. And, uh, my guess is probably they, as a whole, had far fewer mutations and therefore have longer life expectancies and therefore were healthier and able to develop to be larger. But that's even true, by the way, among not just insects, but many animals. Uh, lions, for example. The lions that were extinct, that aren't around, when we compare fossils with lions today, were much larger. And so it's true, as far as we know, with all life. And my guess is the reason it's true is because of the accumulation of mutations. They had fewer mutations, therefore they were healthier, therefore they lived longer, therefore they grew larger because they were healthier, and therefore they uh, lived to be older, and therefore were able to uh, mature to a greater degree. Exactly how old do you think the earth is? All the scriptures say about six to ten thousand, so I wasn't there, so if we rely upon the scriptures, I guess we need to, that's a good number. It's certainly, when we have information which says it's really young, and information that says it's old, we got a problem. And the creation ex nihilo and the appearance of design solves that problem. So you're going to have some evidence says it's young, some evidence says it's old. And therefore, well, creation ex nihilo will solve that problem, just like it solves the problem of, of uh, Adam. Biological systems have development phases. Right. I'd just be interested to, to hear... Uh, hear your, your viewpoint on where development processes overlap with increasing mutation processes. You talked earlier about how aging is actually a, a series of muta collection of mutation processes, but when you take from a small child to young adult to a, an older adult, that's a developmental processes, but I don't see the two as being the same. Is, is that true? Or right, no, they're different, but of course mutations begin as soon as the child is conceived and uh, hopefully the first 10, 12, 13 years of life, there are small number of mutations that don't cause major problems. It's only when you get to what they call a mutational meltdown. That means that you can accumulate a lot of mutations and you don't die or it doesn't cause major problems until you get a lot more. And so the first, say, 10 million mutations don't cause a problem. But when you start to get to 12, 13, 14 million, then you end up closer toward the mutational meltdown, and then the problems are more apparent. So they're not apparent at first because a bunch of mutations don't cause a problem because most 
0.9 or so are near neutral mutations. So by themselves, the vast majority don't cause a problem. It's only when they pile up that causes the problem. It's like the camel that broke the, the camel, the straw that broke the camel's back. It's the same example. Go ahead. The human genome and that of other organisms, how does that affect evolution as far as, does it bring more questions into evolution? Oh, clearly, right, because nobody ever dreamed that the human genome would be not only as complex, but as interrelated and designed the way it is. Nobody ever expected, uh, Darwin didn't have a clue as to all of this. He thought the cell was about as complex as a bowl of jelly. And so the more we learn about the cell, the more complex it becomes, and also the more interrelated it becomes. It's not just complex, complexity for complexity, it's enormously interrelated, so that if you affect one part, you affect many others, which I tried to show in a number of slides. So, and it's, Epigenesis is a whole new field that we're realizing that genes can be turned off by what they call methylation. And it's a whole new area which is really opening up a whole new area of biology where genes can be turned on or off. We know this because you take two identical twins, you compare the genes that are on and off and they're identical when you're really young. As you get older and older, the two genomes become more and more different. Even though genetically they're identical because a lot of genes are turned on and off. Many turned off primarily. Epigenesis turns genes off. I have questions in two areas. One, as a, as a typical layman, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a common perception that most fossils are of extinct species. Has there ever been a determination made as to what percentage of currently existing species are in the fossil record? And if, if it's a high number, wouldn't that help the creation argument? Yeah, the vast majority of fossils they find are of animal life and plant life that are still around today. They estimate between 50 and 100,000 uh, species have gone extinct, judging by evidence we have in the fossil record. Now, evolutionists estimate more because they have to have lots of transitional forms. But as far as evidence is concerned, we know between 50 and 100,000 species that were alive are not alive today because of the fossil record, like the dinosaurs. It's the best example. A problem too is you have a hard time judging species by fossils. If we would, didn't know anything about dogs and found the fossils of dogs in the fossil record, we would probably classify them as 30 different species. But today we know that all dogs are dogs, they all can interbreed, they're different sizes, different traits, but they're all dogs. But if we just had the bones, in the fossil record, we would classify dogs, and this is commonly talked about in paleontology books, we found just the bones, we would probably conclude we had, oh, at least 10 or 15 different species. You know, take a Pekingese and a Great Dane. Enormous differences, not just in size, but other traits as well. So thank you, good, good question. And the other was with respect to the ga galaxies being billions of years away and you know, how can we see them if, we've, if the universe has only been in existence for thousands of years? And my explanation to people when I'm talking is, I, I say as far as I'm aware, there's really only two things. Either the light was, when creation happened, the light between them and us was in place, or the speed of light has greatly diminished since creation. Is there any... What's the what's the um, the most commonly accepted among the the bigwigs in the creation? Uh, oh, I would say both science. of those, and there are other theories as well. There are a number of theories that try to explain that. I would explain it by as the blood was created moving in Adam's veins when he was created, light was also created moving in the universe because the universe has to be created as a fully functioning existing universe to exist, just like a body has to be created as a fully functioning, living unit to exist. And that's how Henry Morris explains it in his uh, book, The Genesis Flood. And I think that's a valid explanation. You were saying that hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, the animals were larger because of fewer mutations and stronger and so on. What about uh, human beings? You know, over the last hundred years, the life expectancy has doubled. We're taller, stronger, faster than we ever were. Can you comment yeah. on that? Uh, better nutrition, better health. Uh, if you read his, some of you guys are historians, if you study history, the conditions people lived in a thousand years ago were horrible. Just horrible. Surprised they lived to be 30. <laughs> so we have a whole different conception of what is necessary to keep people healthy today. 
As a follow-up question to the apparent age of the universe, uh, you mentioned it's a miracle, and your picture that you had up on the board of a, maybe it's your grandson or granddaughter, when you look into a baby's eyes, you know it had to be a miracle that God did it. Okay. But my question on the appearance of age, uh, uh, if there's a supernova that exploded 10 million light years away, uh, that was a true event in, in the history of the universe. And God would not deceive us that this event happened. So people like Dr. Ross Humphreys use a gravitational dilation of time to say that events out on the edge of the universe uh, occurred at a frenzied pace while the Earth somewhere near the center uh, went in six 24-hour days. Mm -hmm. it, can you give a follow-up on that or do you uh, accept I, Russ's uh, explanation? I think his explanation is very intriguing. I'm not an astronomer though so I try to talk about things I know a lot about and not talk about things I don't know much about. But yeah, that's possible, but I think the appearance of age explains things pretty well. But again, uh, Russ is doing a good job. I've talked to him about this and he, he says most of the evidence shows a young Earth, but some clearly shows an old Earth, which fits my explanation very well. Uh, hi, Dr. Bergman. Your presentation was excellent, by the Thank way. You. Um, my question is, has to do with something you didn't cover tonight, but you've been in this industry or in this uh, field for a long time. How do you feel the climate versus for creation uh, science has changed academically from when you started till now? Uh, it's getting more and more hostile. When I, church groups are always really nice, no problem, but when I speak at universities, some people are just really hostile. I mean, they're just unbelievably hostile. Dwayne Gish mentioned his chapter that I have in my book here, that when he started speaking about this topic at universities, people were very, very receptive. Almost invariably, he got a lot of warm fuzzies from the audience. And he noticed that as time went on, they became more and more hostile. And I think that's because of groups, because of like uh, Eugenie Scott's, that is basically, I call it a hate campaign against creationists. I know I'm quoted in one book by a well-known author, a best-selling book, and this person actually said, I'm dangerous to this country because I'm trying to do all kinds of awful things. I'm trying to establish theocracy. You know, I have a hard time getting my kids to post a, a note on Amazon. <laughs> I'm supposed to create theocracy. I'm just worried about controlling my daughter, my son. You know, that's, that's enough challenge for me. It's ludicrous, some of the arguments they're coming up with. It's really ludicrous. Although I'm flattered to the authors claim that I'm basically trying to take over the world, I'm flattered that he thought I had much power to do so. I never <laughs> thought that, <laughs> never even thought of that as being possible, let alone uh, true as he implies. So some of these guys are really off the wall. They're just really vicious against, we're dangerous to the economy and there are too many creationists in the state, business will move out because they won't have well-trained people and on and on and on. That's covered quite a bit in my uh, book, Slot of the Dissidents. So it's coming, becoming more and more hostile. I think it's becoming so hostile that a lot of people who are neutral look at it and say, wait a minute, what's going on with these Darwinists? Why are they so fanatical? Why are they, you know, they're behaving very foolish. I think that's what happened when I spoke in, uh, in Kansas once where somebody started calling me names and started accusing me of all kinds of terrible things. And I talked to several people afterward and they said, he made you more credible. You know, his irrational tirade was such where people look at that side and look at my side and my side looks much better. So I think it, I think in time it will backfire because they're getting so irrational. Uh, this may be a digression but I remember uh, being in a presentation or reading a presentation about a bacteria being propelled by a little motor on a hair and I think I've heard someplace that our cells have say a very tiny electromechanical pump. Yeah. Uh, would you maybe comment? And uh, there's a field called nanotechnology and electromechanical, microelectromechanical devices. I don't know, you maybe want to comment on I have a whole machines in, in, in our that. body? Right. We know there are many machines. Kinesian is the best example. Kinesian is a, what they call a motor protein, which actually carries stuff from one part of the cell to another. And it carries it not by sliding along 
the roads inside the cell, the microtubules, but it carries it literally by walking. One foot goes forward, it binds to the road, the bonds to the uh, back foot are broken, it moves forward, bonds to the road, and then of course these bonds are broken and it literally walks across the uh, cell uh, roads. And you can see that partially in the film Expelled. If you haven't seen that, I would strongly encourage everyone to see that film. And there are other films I have two or three I show in my class. But kinesin are well-known, well-respected motor proteins. And that's only one of many uh, proteins which we see as a field called nanotechnology, as you, you brought out. And the bacteria flagellum is probably one of the best examples, which is quite fascinating to study. There's a recent book out by Francis Collis, I think his Collins, name is. Yeah, which I read, yeah. The Language of God. Right. Have you read the whole book? Yep. The first 60 or 70 pages sounded pretty good, and then he launched into a, a, a totally Darwinian approach to everything. Yeah, he really contradicts himself. He says in parts of it, evolution's impossible, and he gives some really good examples. And... You could almost say his book is schizophrenic. I guess like some people are. <laughs> but, yeah, he does a really good job showing why evolution is impossible. Then he tries to argue against creationism and intelligent design. And he does a very poor job of both of those areas. Probably because, as many people, they really don't know what they're talking about. The other book that I'm reading now is called uh, Ye uh, Youth uh, Thin Diet. I haven't got the name of it quite right, but Eric Breverman, B -R, or Braverman, B-R-A-V-E-R-M-A-N, is a brain chemistry expert. Mm -hmm. And he believes that all parts of the brain have to be working as they should, and there are four chemicals that the brain requires. Um, have you? Or I would say 400. That Okay, one caution on that. It said, beware of a man who has read one book. And that means you need to read both sides. I probably have 120 books in my library written against creationism and ID. You have to read both sides before you understand both sides and before you can come to a conclusion. And I can talk about the other side. In fact, we had a debate once and they couldn't find anybody to debate the other side. So I volunteered. I could debate the evolutionary side. I think I could do a pretty good job. But they decided to call the debate off, debate off, but you need to understand both sides, I think, to understand one side. So always look at both sides carefully before you make up your mind. You mentioned something about uh, if you were to find dogs in the fossil record, you'd have 30 different examples of 30 different species. We have an example here in Pittsburgh uh, with the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Museums. We're fortunate enough to have the actual bones, which in many cases are used as uh, chest bones that are, that are used as the, um, the type bones that are sent out to other museums. Uh -huh. And here in, in the Carnegie Museum, there's a dinosaur, Diplodocus Carnegie. And it turns out that there's another dinosaur that is right beside it, which looks almost identical to it, except that it's named after his wife because she complained so much about the money that he spent uh, run, on acquiring these dinosaurs. So here's an example of a, of, a, of a second species that was named that way for strictly, not only political, but, but uh, uh, har harmony within the, within the home. So. Yep. So nothing has changed over the last hundred years. You've got to keep track of what's going on in evolution. Uh, we have been saying, evolutionists have been saying for the past hundred years that we evolved from an ape-like creature, namely the chimpanzee. Now, headline, local paper, just read it today, Pittsburgh Tribune Review, study monkeys with ancestors, and now the new study concludes that we're closer to orangutans than chimps. And they claim, it's wrong, but they claim we're uh, G DNA is 98.9% .9 similar to chimps. Well, that's all out the window now, but this person says, nope, we're more like orangutans than we are chimps. Right here at Pittsburgh, a uh, university professor at the University of Pittsburgh, anthropologist, which shows how it changes. It shows that, you know, you've got to keep up because what's true today in science tomorrow may be a myth, which this may turn out to be such. There's a local Christian college uh, near Pittsburgh called Waynesburg, mm -hmm. and uh, I invited some of the professors to hear your presentation. And one of the professors respond, responded quite negatively, and I'd like to 
ask you to respond to some of his comments. Okay. Besides asking me to remove him from the email list and uh, stated that creationism is a heresy and a lack of faith, but the last paragraph I'd like to read, and uh, it says this, get over yourself, evolution is a fact, be uh, proven beyond any shadow of doubt by a half dozen independent lines of reasoning and an undeniable mountain of evidence. And it can be observed right under your nose, in the laboratory, and in the world, if you just open your eyes and your mind. I, I responded that I would remove him from the list, but I also asked him to cite an example of this evolution that's right under our noses so that I could, you know, ask Dr. Bergman to respond to that. He hasn't responded, and so I thought well, maybe you've had some similar discussions with other Christians. Um, <clears throat> If you were to press them, what type? You think they're referring to microevolution? How would you respond to that? Oh, yeah. I have a lot of books which are written against creation and ID, and basically they have page after page after page of examples, and they're all micro changes. They're all small changes. They're all relatively small changes. And in order to prove evolution, what we need to prove is from molecules to man, from the goo to you by way of the zoo. That's what we have to demonstrate. Nobody argues about these small changes. I mean, we, through breeding dogs, look at what we produce. All dogs came from a wolf. And look what we produce. 300 and some breeds of dogs, very, very different. We have a dachshund. Very, very different. Temperament, pattern, behavior from other dogs. So, sure, there's enormous amount of genetic flexibility. Uh, more and more evidence come, is coming out that concludes that all cats, lions, tigers, cheetahs, etc., are all part of the cat family, and they can all interbreed. At the Creation Museum, they have, I forget which one it is, but it's a, a lion and a tiger, I think. They have a liger, but they've got two or three of these between breeds, and we used to think they can interbreed. A lion can't interbreed with a cat. Well, size differences is a problem, but when we breed in between, and when we try to do so, we find my conclusion is, we'll see, but my conclusion is that all cats, like all dogs, can interbreed. And all cats are all cats. And look at the difference between a house cat and a lion and a tiger. Enormous difference. Same difference we see among dogs and among horses. If you like horses, you see the same thing. You have horses that are, you know, this tall. You have some horses that are monstrous. You have very clear differences between horses. They're all horses. No one's arguing that there's a great deal of genetic variation. What we're arguing about is from the goo to you by way of the zoo. And there's simply no evidence whatsoever. And when people say things like this, I say, fine, let's you know, show, us, show us the evidence. And they look at, you know, E. coli, bacteria, development of resistance against antibiotics. And this is not only not very impressive, but people who make these claims are not aware of what creationists teach. Because otherwise they wouldn't make those claims at all. A problem is so many people have only read one book. I ask him, how many books that support creationism has he read? Or, or better yet, he'll say, oh, I've read lots of them. Better yet, say, fine, you tell me the books you've read and I'll send you a quiz on them and we'll <laughs> see how well you do. And better when you can get them in person, say, you read Henry Morris's book? Here's a quiz. Take it. Let's see how much you're, well, I don't remember any of this stuff. Did you read it? Well, I guess I only glanced at it. And all of a sudden you find their claims disappear. One thing I've seen in books written against creationism is the people don't know what we believe. And that's just obvious. And they wonder why they're not very convincing. Well, you have to understand what we believe first, then write against us. And they don't do this, which is frustrating. Now, Jerry Coyne's new book, it's a bestseller on the internet. He doesn't know what we teach. You know, it's embarrassing. I would think it's, it's embarrassing to him if he really knew what we taught because he's assuming so many things, which are not true. So that's my response to it. He should, if he has all the evidence, then tell him to come and we'll set up a debate. I'll be glad to fly down and we'll debate. Right, but he's probably referring to uh, a variations within a kind, small right. micro Oh, I'm sure he is, yeah. Right. But if he's so confident of his position, I was set up to debate Richard Dawkins last uh, March of last year, all set up, and he, they were set up by the Atheist Society, and they emailed me and said, he, Richard wants to see your Vita. So 
So I sent on my Vita. About a month later, I got an email from the Atheist Society in Indianapolis, and they said, he has backed out. He doesn't want to debate you. And that's typical. I'm scheduled to debate P.Z. Myers in November. I'm not holding my breath. But I'm scheduled to debate P.Z. Myers, who's probably one of the most famous evolutionists today. He's in the film Expelled in November. And they keep, he keeps saying, yep, I'm going to debate him. But we'll see. We'll see if he indeed does. But he can. What can he say to this stuff? I mean, he can't. And they don't. So... I'd like to get a copy of that debate, or at least the audio. If yeah, there are going, if he him. indeed does, if he doesn't back out. We're just, I'm assuming he'll back out, but maybe he won't. Do you have a location? Yeah. Minneapolis, in University of Minneapolis. Okay. But one follow-up question. Uh, you noticed that the scientific, uh, an increase in hostility from the scientific community toward the creationists. Clearly. Do you see any trends within the Christian community and Christian colleges? Like, I was kind of surprised to get this from a Christian college, but, but do you see yeah, improvement all, or decline? All too or? often the Christian colleges are siding with the establishment, just like the church did with Galileo. The church sided with the academic establishment and that was Galileo's problem. It wasn't the church. The church was at the beginning on his side and the academics went to the roof and said he's contradicting Aristotle, he's wrong, and then the church sided with academia and they're doing the same thing today. They're siding with what they think is correct. I mean, everybody knows that we evolved, so the church wants to side with those that are correct. And that's what they're doing, and unfortunately, they're not siding with those that are really correct, they're siding with those that appear to be correct. I have a, a, an interest in information systems and, and uh, processes. When, when I looked at the, the diagram that you, you had up there showing the, uh, the double helix, and explaining that the genes aren't just simple sequences, but they're actually interlocked sequences. And I thought, you know, how much of that gene has to work based on the information that it's got to be this piece overlaps that piece, but the other one's inside and things like that. And the mutations within that gene obviously cause the, the biological system to mutate. Are there similar kinds of uh, effects that you see in information systems? Yeah, there are. And it's not just they overlap, it's that the genes are spliced, moved around, you take a piece here, take a piece there, splice them together, take a piece here, take a piece over there. It's like a computer keyboard. Just a lot of information and we put the intelligence in the computer in order to produce what is produced. Well, the genes are just lots of letters and they have to be rearranged and processed to produce information which allows the cell to function. And we don't really understand where that comes from. It's a whole new area, which is totally, we used to think the genes were the boss. The computer's not the boss, we are. And who is the boss of our genome? We don't know, which is what makes biology fascinating. Uh, I'm a microbiologist by training, and I graduated from Pitt, and in graduate school as a theistic evolutionist. And I became very convinced from what I read in the literature, the problem with Darwinianism isn't uh, mutations after you have the information, it's getting the information to start. You start out as a biological organism, as a microbiological organism in the most simple organisms with a certain limited number of, of genes. You have to have the information to start. There's nothing to select for. You can't select for uh, inanimate uh, ions or other things. There has to be a selective process. So there is no explanation for how you get from this size of genetic information to this size without anything to work on. You have to be doing de novo synthesis along the way. Right. And that's why when I present this information, my critics tend to respond emotionally because they can't respond uh, rationally. It's said in court. If you have the facts, you hammer on the facts. If you don't have the facts, you hammer on the person. If you can't hammer on the person, you hammer on the table. <laughs> and you see this in the court prize spent a lot of time working for the courts. So I used to work for the courts for three years. You see this a lot. And I see lawyers doing this over and over again. And this is how they respond to us. They don't have the facts. They, in fact, they rarely hammer on the facts. They hammer on me. If they can't hammer on me, they just hammer on the table. Make lots of noise. Other comments? 
One other question. If, if some of the people in the audience wanted to uh, purchase a book to give to a local high school science teacher, are there any that you would recommend uh, over others? Uh, well, Philip Johnson's books are pretty well done, and he doesn't deal with the AIDS question. The AIDS question really is the question that really upsets people the most. That's the, that's the question that is probably by the top. I mean, the mutation information I presented, I presented this to medical schools several times, and no one disagrees. There's no disagreement. You know, they recognize what I'm trying to say. The AIDS question is really a stickler, and that's why I think we need to focus on, the, as I did, the creation of Adam, appearance of AIDS, although I don't want to discount Humphrey's work and others that are doing work on this, but the appearance of AIDS explains data on both sides. So it's, a, to me, an effective way of dealing with it. And like I say, Henry Morris talked about this in, what, 61? And we seem to have forgotten about this section of his book. And we should point to it more often and move on. I, I like to focus on things we can win. And the mutation concern, we've won that. Muta mutations can't produce what we claim it can. Evolutionists claim it can. Vestigial organ arguments, same thing. There are no vestigial organs. My anatomy and physiology book, you look up vestigial in the back, there's nothing there. The word's not there. When you talk about the appendix and the adenoids and all these structures, it says what they all do. There's no organ in my A&P book that says this is vestigial, it doesn't do anything. And that's true of every A&P book I've used. A&P is anatomy and physiology. So there's no argument that we have no vestigial organs. They all have some function. Some have less function than others but they all have some function. And you mentioned b before last time you were here that the junk DNA argument is also uh, fizzling out because what they used to think had no purpose, they're finding purposes for that. Rapidly. They are finding dozens and dozens of purposes for the so-called junk DNA. The conclusion now is, is much of it, if not most of it, has a function. Probably almost all of it has a function. Certainly there's some damaged DNA because of mutations, but I think we're going to find virtually all of it has a function. Regulatory function seems to be a key function of so-called junk DNA. So that's another argument they've lost in time. At first it seemed like they won it, but now the tables have turned the other way. Sometimes a lot of thing, a lot of times what we have to do is just be patient. You know, these questions will be answered by science. And I've seen that over and over, and that's just one example. Pseudogenes is another example. Uh, that was a strong argument, but now they're finding most pseudogenes, or many at least, do have functions, regulatory functions primarily, and changing everything. That no longer is being touted as proof of evolution. Pseudogenes are genes which seem to be damaged genes that once were functional. So they're called pseudogenes. They look like genes, but they don't function as genes. So we call them pseudogenes, false genes. But we're finding they indeed do have a very important function. So study biochemistry and you learn all this stuff. Other questions at all? It's been a good audience. I hope you appreciate it. If you want to talk to me after we're here, I'll be around for a few minutes.